You know, we were just talking moments ago about the uh, Biden administration and the economic changes that he will be making, as any president does when they newly uh, enter office, and how some some of those changes are not going to necessarily be to our advantage. One of the big ones that was announced on day one of the Biden presidency was the cancellation of the Keystone XL pipeline. This had been expected. We, No one in Canada should have been shocked that that happened. But it was still very upsetting for some people, particularly our friends in Western Canada. I want to bring on Philip Rossetti. He's a senior, a resident senior fellow for energy and environmental policy at the R Street Institute. You know, Philip, thanks so much for being here. Let's actually talk for a minute about not uh, just the, the blindingly obvious fact that Biden was going to cancel Keystone. It's important to talk about why. And I think this is an issue that on both sides of the border has sort of hardened a little bit into a political culture war point more than it actually is an economic or an environmental one. But when Keystone was first proposed, the argument really was that Canada, a reliable, stable ally, could provide the United States with some of the energy it would need to become energy independent. But then the pipeline dragged on for so long, guess what? The United States has basically become energy dependent, and it doesn't need the pipeline. Thank you for having me. Uh, That's exactly the political thinking on this. Uh, The Obama administration dragged out the approval process for so long. Uh, U.S. oil production essentially boomed, and it made it much easier for Obama to cancel the pipeline. Uh, But, of course, the issue at hand here is who do you want actually making these sort of economic decisions? Should it be politicians uh, or should it be private investors? Uh, Generally, we expect that private investors are much better at actually identifying value and uh, economic propositions than politicians are. Uh, That shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. And the real question here is going to be, uh, is this a signal that Biden is going to be using his executive authority in an even more aggressive fashion than Obama did uh, to insert politics into these issues? Because it was a bit of a surprise. uh, Well, I shouldn't say a surprise, but it was uh, a bit unprecedented that Obama was using the State Department in such a fashion, uh, because normally approval for interstate commerce, especially for something with Canada uh, is not a controversial topic, uh, but given the uh, in upcoming Paris Agreement at the time under the Obama administration, he was under a lot of pressure to cancel it and uh, be viewed as a climate leader. Uh, the climate impacts from the pipeline are uh, not going to be substantial because there is a demand side of this equation, and uh, if Canada is not su- uh, providing the supply, other countries will. Uh, given that this is heavy crude oil, it might be Venezuela and uh, other uh, Know, big suppliers. Uh, but you're exactly right. You know, this is a political issue more so than an economic one. Uh, and it's 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 going to be a sign of perhaps things to come. You know, just as in, in my job here as a Canadian political observer, among, among other things, to me, whatever arguments we would want to make economically, whatever arguments we would want to make environmentally, and I think we could make arguments on both those fronts. I mean, I think Canada had a pretty good case to make in terms of the economics or the environmental policy side here. But what I knew was going to kill us was the politics, because there's nothing we could argue from from Ottawa or from Alberta, where the pipeline would originate from, that is going to do President Biden any favors whatsoever in firming up the, the left flank of his party. That is a problem, and I'm not saying this dismissively, but it's a problem that exists within the Biden administration, and there's nothing we can do from abroad to argue his way out of that here. That was the political reality that was going to kill us, whatever the economic or environmental case might have been. I'd say that's a good read on the situation. Uh, you know, If you look at the regulatory process for approving a pipeline, uh, it's extremely stringent. You know, there was no stone left unturned for Keystone XL. It had to go through the exact same uh, environmental review process as any other major project. Uh, some would say more so, uh, and it passed all of those, uh, but it still wasn't enough. Uh, the indication really is that there is going to be no amount of uh, review and oversight that is going to be satisfying to uh, folks who just really don't want to use oil or continue to rely on oil, uh, regardless of Uh, The fact that it still has a a huge amount of economic utility in our current market, and we still do need it for transportation. Uh, Liquid fuels are are not nearly as substitutable as some of the electricity stuff. Uh, So this is going to be an issue for a while. And 
it, it really is going to raise the question of what is this going to mean for new regulatory burdens? What is it going to mean for a project that has to satisfy those political elements? Is there enough that they can do? Is no bar uh, attainable? Well, and, and that's going to be an issue, right? And, I mean, and for, for the Biden administration, even carving out the, the Canadian side of this, this is not going to be the last time that the White House has to deal with this issue, right? Because, you know, Keystone is a relatively simple, straightforward, a highly symbolic move that President Biden can make. But for the rest of his term, for four years or more, he's going to have similar conversations, right? He's going to have to balance the demands of uh, kind of the moderate middle of American politics, including organized labor who want the jobs of this, combined obviously with the national security imperatives of energy independence. But he's also going to have an increasingly powerful uh, left leftist block within the Democratic movement that wants stronger climate action, and they want it now. I'd say that's a good read on it. Yeah. If you look at Gina McCarthy, his uh, climate hire for domestic policy, uh, she'll be heading up most of Biden's domestic climate policy. And she was the CEO and president of the NRDC, which was uh, an advocacy group that was staunchly opposed to Keystone XL, has been very opposed to any kind of uh, expansion of these resources uh, in anywhere, really. Uh, so it, it's not going to be surprising to see that have a lot of influence in how Biden approaches these issues. Uh, The climate issue has definitely become more prominent recently. It's become something that shows a lot of contrast, and there's a a big divergence in how people view it, uh, because a lot of people view the responsibility as with the oil companies and with uh, the presidency and how they respond to it, uh, and others view it as more of a, a a personal issue, an individual issue of responsibility and how we uh, moderate our own behaviors to uh, reduce our carbon footprint. So this is going to be pulling Biden in both directions. Uh, He's going to be under the pressure from the business side to show that America is really open for business, that it can pull itself out of the recession, and that politics aren't going to be the guiding factor for investors. Uh, But on the other hand, he is going to be pulled very far uh, on the left side where They're going to want to see more aggressive climate action, and they're going to want to see him do everything he possibly could do with his executive authority. Uh, So it's going to be very interesting to see how he's actually able to moderate those elements and span this divide, if he'll span this divide, or if he is going to just give in to uh, the advocacy arm and say, hey, you know, I I hear you and I will respect this and I will do what I can. Uh, And that's still a bit of an unknown quantity. Within within everything we're saying here, Philip, I mean, ki- killing Keystone made sense. What will be, I don't mean to ask you to make too firm predictions here, but I'm just wondering, is there other low-hanging fruit the president's likely to reach for here? I mean, what do we expect to see relatively early as part of his environmental agenda? Do we expect to see more of an emphasis on maybe subsidies for renewable energy? Do we want to see fuel efficiency standards, things like that? Killing Keystone might have been his first step, but what is probably the American market already starting to price in for what his next uh, and probably fairly quick steps will be? Uh, The subsidies are going to rely a bit on congressional uh, support as well, though that support has always been there. Uh, Every time that subsidies for renewable energies have been about to lapse, uh, Congress has found a a way to uh, put the sunset further delayed. Uh, In terms of the executive authority, we're already seeing big moves on moratoriums for leases. So about a little more than a quarter of land in the United States is owned by the federal government, uh, and oil or gas production on that land requires approval from the federal government. Uh, Biden has already said he's going to put a moratorium on those leases and put in place some new restrictions on uh, how they're actually reviewed. Uh, We're probably going to see similar decisions with Keystone, as we saw with um, or as we may see with natural gas export facilities, which are, uh, you know, growing pretty substantially in the United States because we have uh, substantial shale resources. Uh, If those are also blocked in the same way as Keystone is, uh, that's going to be a windfall for foreign energy suppliers like Russia, uh, Venezuela, Iran, uh, these countries that are going to say, hey, we have the supply. We don't have any constraints on how we're going to use our resources, uh, because a lot of those resources are owned by governments. They're not owned by 
private uh, investors the way that we have a, a tradition of in Canada and the US, United States. So, yes, I would definitely say we can expect to see uh, a full-throated regulatory endorsement, efficiency standards, uh, moratoriums, uh, approvals, everything that Biden can do to uh, insert a, a decision on his behalf on these projects, uh, he will try to stretch his regulatory authority to the limits. Philip, really appreciate your time. Uh, fascinating time, obviously, for all of this. I can only imagine how busy you are right now keeping up with all the changes. We really appreciate your time this morning. Thanks for coming on. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you. I, I definitely appreciate being here, and uh, you have a great day. Yeah, you too. We'll do it again. That was uh, Philip Rossetti, uh, Resident Senior Fellow for Energy and Environmental Policy at the R Street Institute. And I suspect with the Biden administration now completing its first week at office, a very busy man.